The Marshal. Thank you very much, uh, dear Marina Hatsopoulos, for uh, participating on the podcast uh, called Marshall. You have uh, a very interesting uh, LinkedIn profile and uh, you are a kind of superwoman in the uh, venture capital world and in technology. And uh, I have so many questions uh, for you. So if you don't mind, if we can start this podcast interview. Sounds great. Excellent. So, dear Marina, you, were, you are an MIT graduate? Yes. Excellent. And uh, the topic of your thesis was? So, um, I did a design thesis on um, an urban mobility device. So, my goal was to um, create um, a device that you could use in the city that would be allow you to travel quickly, but would be safe, very easy, quick to slip on and off, and um, inexpensive. Um, so it was uh, it was fun. It was interesting, uh, and uh, but it wasn't really commercially viable. I didn't understood what kind of device it was. Uh... So it was um, it was similar. If you imagine rollerblades, um, sort of similar to that, but um, you would put something on top of your shoe, uh, more like old fashioned roller skates. Um, and so you'd wear your regular shoes and then put these wheels sort of strap yourself into some wheels so that you could roll yourself around the city. Okay. It sounds like a story from uh, Star Trek. I mean, actually, <laughs> in fact, you are doing so many Star Trek uh, things like, uh, the investment that you have done in the Inkbeat and uh, in the Levitronics. I mean, Levitronics is uh, about uh, devices, magnetic leviated devices. I mean, can you talk about your after MIT work? I mean, what happened to you? Did you invest into some kind of startup company and uh, you became a multimillionaire afterwards? Or what, 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 what's your story? Yeah. Not at all. So uh, I went to MIT and my goal in going to MIT was to um, learn enough about technology in order to be able to manage engineers. Um, so I had a dream of being an entrepreneur of a technology startup. And um, but I, I wanted needed more of a technical background. So that's why I went to MIT. Um, and then after I graduated, I felt that I was missing one more piece, um, which was management experience. So I tried to get a job in management, um, but unfortunately was not able to get that because my background didn't really fit the profile. Typically, someone going into management would have an MBA, um, but I had already um, done that in, uh, at Chase Manhattan Bank. We had a one-year training program. So I didn't want to do an MBA. I wanted to do what was missing in my education, which was the technical side. Um, so I wasn't able to get a job in management. Um, and so finally, in frustration, I went back to my thesis advisor at MIT, who advised me to find a technology within MIT. And I was introduced to the MIT Technology Licensing Office So what they do is they pay patent inventions that are made by the students and the professors, and then they look for companies and individuals to commercialize those technologies. And I found a technology in 3D printing back in the early 90s um, before anybody knew what 3D printing was. Um, and there were two inventors at MIT who were um, working on this, and um, we started Z Corporation. So that was really... Um, my uh, the start of my entrepreneurship was uh, forming uh, co-founding Z Corporation. Four of us out of MIT. Excellent. So <clears throat> basically, um, because of this uh, commercialization uh, of uh, noble uh, research work, you are currently also national board member of the research and innovation of the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, Correct. Correct. I think that the country needs a lot of commercialization for, for the research that uh, we are creating. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's very true. So okay. it's, a, it's a spot on. It's a spot on. It's a very, it was a very good choice to put you there. 
it was a very good choice. It's, uh, you know, I, I've seen the same thing in both Greece and Cyprus, which is um, both countries seem to be very good at educating um, people who are smart, they're hungry, they want to work hard. Um, and as scientists and researchers, they're doing amazing work. Um, you can look at the publications, the patents, the grants that they're getting from the EU, and they're all amazing. Um, but what they're not able to do is to take that research and commercialize it. And so that's really the missing piece, I think, for these um, economic ecosystems, these this startup ecosystem to get going and to to build on real scientific deep technology as opposed to simply the mobile apps, which we've been seeing so far. That's an excellent topic. I mean, let's zoom in a little bit on this one because your experience on MIT and currently on the, as, an, as a member of the, the National Board of Research and Innovation, um, there is a very interesting part related to this commercialization of new ideas. What do you think, what, what is your belief, what are the three elements that basically you need to identify or create in order to take a noble idea and actually commercialize it? Um, well, the most important thing is the team. And very often, I think where things get hung up is that very often the professor doing leading the research does not want to leave his position. Um, you know, an academic has a different kind of a mindset than an entrepreneur. Um, and that's totally okay. And a lot of great startups start up with just that structure of a professor who has initiated some research but does not want to go full-time to do that. And what we see um, in the United States and particularly out of MIT is the professor might work one day a week at the startup But there are, there's an entrepreneur who's taken the lead in managing the commercialization and, um, and really taking over the business side um, while leveraging off the technical expertise of the professor. So at the end of the day, um, often, you know, w one thing that is very difficult to make work, it has worked in some cases, but What's difficult to make work is for the professor to try to do a startup and remain a professor at the same time, because those are both two full-time jobs, um, and uh, you can't do it halfway. You really need to go all out. Okay, one element is the team and uh, yeah. the very challenging job to convince professors to leave their comfort zone and come into the fire zone of startups. That's the most uh, difficult part of everything. Well, what do you think that the other two elements they are in beyond of the team? Yeah, so um, intellectual property is extremely important. And um, obviously, there are many startups that do not have intellectual property. But the ones that I am familiar with and that I think have the greatest chance of success are ones that have strong, broad patents. Um, they have a lot of know-how that they've developed over years of research. Um, they have um, trade secrets. Uh, and so uh, it's really a combination of this kind of intellectual property that allows you to stay ahead. And so I can give you an example at Z Corporation. Uh, we had some very broad patents and there were some large companies that were investigating our technology and would have very much liked to steal it. But they knew that our technology was patented and was the patents were so broad that we were going to be able to take them to court if they tried to copy what we had done. Um, and so that was extremely important because at the end of the day, it was really this idea that was so novel. But in terms of the actual embodiment of our machine, um, that is something that other companies could have copied. Um, But likewise, also what is important is trade secrets. And we maintained on our 3D printing, um, we had sold materials um, that were proprietary. And in order to get them patented, we had to disclose what kinds of materials they were. But in the patent disclosure, we did not have to disclose things like the brand name. And it turns out that sometimes simply the brand of which product you're working with 
makes a difference in the final end quality of the part. Um, and so, um, you know, we maintain certain um, trade secrets like that to make sure that people couldn't just copy us. You were describing, uh, dear Marina, a very complex problem, uh, starting from the human factor of uh, uh, the individuals that they consist, the team, the intellectual property that they create, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the details around the, the quality of a product that includes also the branding element. Mm -hmm. Th those are very difficult and challenging projects to manage. Um, did you make an exit with the, the Z Corporation or? We did. We sold after 10 years. Well, wow, congratulations. And how much money you exit on that one? Oh, I, uh, it's not disclosed. Ah, it's not disclosed. <laughs> All right. Okay. Very good. And uh, after the, the Z Corporation, did you move in uh, into continuing as an uh, angel investor? And uh, how did your career progress after the Z Corporation or the MIT in general? Yes. Yeah, so um, after that, I um, took on several board roles, public company, um, larger public company, as well as smaller private company. Um, and also advising startups and uh, doing some angel investing. Um, and then I got involved with the Greek startup scene, which I found really exciting um, because it, um, to me, it's sort of like the startup. Greece itself is sort of like a startup um, after the economic crisis. And, and what I, has made me so hopeful and optimistic about Greece is um, – the kind of um, hunger that you see in the youth um, to really make things happen. And it's um, a culture that I think is extremely positive for the country of, of making things happen. Um, but anyway, the board work um, and angel investing is how I spent um, uh, the years right after selling Z Corporation. Plus writing some very beautiful articles and uh, non-fiction uh, literature. Thank you. I read the one related to your husband. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so coming back uh, to the Greek uh, startup scene, uh, you, 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 you wrote a, a, a nice uh, article in Huffington Post related to... I would say that your article it was mainly a summary of the landscape. Like, yes. uh, yeah, is that true? Correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it was a summary of the landscape. It's like uh, from Sun Ju, the art of war, knowing the landscape before you you make an entry. Sure. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So what do you think... I will agree with you about the Greek entrepreneurs being hungry on uh, success. Uh, of course, I have my own personal opinion about, uh, um, you know, because I have lived 20 years in Finland and I have seen how the Finns are working versus how the, the Greeks are working. And I will say there is collectivism in, uh, in Finnish market ver versus egocentric environment in the uh, in, in, in Greece. But, but what's your opinion about like, uh, the situation in, in, in the Greek startup world? Are, are the founders collaborating with each other? Is there cutting throat competition? Uh, are they good in marketing? Because, you know, we don't hear so much news about them. We, we have a very good success stories. Like, mm -hmm. for example, this uh, uh, Net data. I don't know if you know net. You know net. Yes, data. I do. I'm I'm an investor um, through uh, through a venture firm. So yes. <laughs> All right. So you know Cost, Costas. I don't know him. No. Ah, but you, I. You have I know invested him. without the. Okay. Very good. No, no, I didn't invest directly. I invested in a venture firm that invested in them. Ah, excellent, excellent. Yeah. So, what, what do you think about the the Greek uh, startup scene? I mean. What are their problems and what are the, the pros and the cons of the Greek startup scene? 
Yeah. So I think the pros are um, there are a lot of elements that make for a great startup ecosystem similar to Israel. So um, I think Greeks are naturally very independent thinkers. So they're not extremely rules based. Um, and I think that's a big positive um, for being an entrepreneur. Um, I think they're very well educated um, technically. And um, because of the high unemployment rate, it's very easy to hire a solid team. I mean, one thing that's so striking when I meet teams in Greece versus teams in the United States is for the same stage of development, the teams in Greece are much bigger. So where you might see a startup at a certain stage in the States with one or two founders and nothing more, for that same stage of development in Greece, you'll have a team of 10 or 12 um, because um, talent is affordable here, which I think is great. Um, yeah, but of course, you know, we say in the engineering world that uh, nine mothers will not deliver uh, a kid in nine months. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. Um, I think... Um, in terms of weaknesses, one, there are a couple of things that I've noticed, um, cultural differences that I think um, the successful entrepreneurs in Greece grasp pretty quickly. Um, so one of them is that you can't win in the market if everything's a secret. And so I've met entrepreneurs who are looking for funding and they would like me to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And I have great empathy for this because I remember asking people to sign one when I was looking for funding. So it's not a stupid thing to ask for. And I understand why people ask for it. But the way venture works um, in the United States is that the, everyone is looking at so many different deals that they can't offer. They can't sign a confidentiality agreement because they can't run the risk that, you know, this idea comes out somehow and then you're later blamed for it and um and it's just um it's just not practical and so i've had entrepreneurs who wanted funding but because i was unwilling to sign a confidentiality agreement they weren't willing to share their idea and at the end of the day that's not um you you have much more to lose by that approach than you have to gain and at the end of the day, um, it's really important to fully vet your ideas and investors often will give you very useful feedback. For example, um, you know, if you talk to a good venture capitalist who's looking at hundreds and hundreds of deals, if you show your idea, there's a very good chance that he's seen, he or she has seen something very similar um, in the market. And so they can help guide you and tell you, you know, yeah, somebody tried that and it didn't work and here's why. Um, and that's extremely valuable information. So I think this idea of secrecy, um, at the end of the day, a good idea in and of itself is not enough to make a startup. And so putting too much value in just the words of the idea um, is not a good idea. However, having said that, it is important to retain what is proprietary. And so that can be, you know, whatever makes your product um, gives it its secret sauce. You definitely don't need to share that. But there's a lot more you can share openly. So um, I would say that would be probably my number one thing. The number two you hit on, which is um, collaboration. And um I think Greeks are really natural entrepreneurs and natural leaders. Mm, um, I will agree and, on that one. And so I think the sense of collaboration, that we're a team, that we're all moving in the same direction, um, I think that is a cultural shift that um, is evolving. Very good. Well, you have uh, written an article related to the 10 steps to a unicorn, uh, unicorn yes. exit. Yes. Um, and on that article, you have uh, some steps uh, related to, you know, kind of like a, what one should do in order to make a unicorn, uh, unicorn exit. 
Um, what, what do you think that they are the three most important uh, items of those 10 items that you have written over there? Oh, okay. Let me, uh, I have to look it up. Hold on a second. Um, the, the one... The, my, my favorite is create a buzz, uh, hire people that you trust, uh, and uh, stay positive. So, um, and these are all really important things. Um, the trick is not to take them to extreme with all of these. Um, and so, um, for example, hire people you trust is uh, very important. But if you take it to the extreme, then you hire your friends and family um, and that is a very dangerous thing. And that's something that I see a lot of in Greece. Um, I have I see done a lot this mistake so many times. Yeah. And the problem is you can't fire your friends and your family and it makes your life miserable. Um, and so you're either going to lose a friend or you're going to lose a great employee or a terror, you know, whatever. It's uh, it's just not a good situation. Um, so all of these um, 10 items are things that seem obvious um, and that are good in moderation, but um, can be extremely dangerous um, if taken to excess. So, um, uh, so I'm trying to see the ones that, uh, so be nice is one um, and that I've seen uh, a very up close with quite a few entrepreneurs, which is they think that if they're just nice to everyone, everything will work out. And it's good to be I nice. I have done I'm, that mistake as well. <laughs> um, we all want to be nice and we all want people to like us. But at the end of the day, um, being a leader means making difficult decisions. And uh, they may not be popular and people, it may make people angry. It may make people uncomfortable. Um, but that's what being a leader is all about. And so um, you are not there to make friends. That's not your goal. And at a certain point, you kind of have to decide if you have the makeup to do that, um, because I think some people, it just goes too much against their bones. And uh, the other two, I mean, the, the be nice. Uh, for me, the thing that actually work quite nicely because I'm a founder of an ed tech company uh, at dailyademy.com is the create the buzz. Um, mm -hmm. It was, you know, the ed tech business is very hard to penetrate because there are thousands mm -hmm. of e-learning platforms out there. But uh, by creating the, the right brand and the right association, mm -hmm of uh, particular keywords and concepts uh, to our brand and creating the, the buzz, we created a wave and that wave led us to, to have now one of the most, uh, one, one, uh, one of the most recognized brands in the ed tech, in, in our field, in the e-learning space, in the LMS, cloud-based LMS. So mm -hmm. the creating a buzz is, is something that basically uh, it was one of the success elements from my experience. And from what I see from the Greek market is that they don't know uh, how to create that buzz. I mean, at least I don't see them in social media. I don't see them bragging about it. They, they are very introvert in that uh, respect. Like, well, what's your opinion on that one? I actually think that that is something that's very common uh, for technology entrepreneurs. Um, generally, uh, engineers would much prefer to be doing an experiment in the lab than pick up the phone and talk to someone um, or go to a trade show and entertain crowds of people. Um, you know, it's just the kind of personality type. Um, so I think that's very common. Um, and there are risks with creating too much buzz, with uh, spending too much time focusing on creating a buzz, um, because the downside of that is that you end up wasting a lot of time and resources and money, um, which doesn't really add up to anything from a commercial perspective. Um, and so I think that something that most entrepreneurs struggle with that I've seen is how to really target 
how to identify exactly who the end customer is and what's the easiest way to get through all the noise to actually communicate and educate that customer on your innovation. Um, and that's the real trick. Um, and that's what, for some companies, that is what is really their secret sauce. You mean the, the creating the right buzz, right? Yeah, like uh, in how reaching the right buzz is only valuable if it's your customers buzzing. And so finding a way to reach your customers most cost effectively um, and so that they're talking to each other and um, so that you can educate them on your innovation. Trying to tell that to the professors that you trying to get out from the comfort zone on how to create right. a buzz in the market. It's like a mission impossible. Yeah. So basically you also have uh, your own uh, uh, blog uh, where you write uh, fiction, like uh, it's called the uh, windystreet.com, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's, not, it's not a blog. It's, a, um, it's just a website where I put anything that has been published independently. So um, I don't, I don't just publish my own. Uh, I don't self-publish. I wait till something has been published and then I post it there. Have you written any book? Um, no, I'm uh, trying to do a collection of short stories right now. Uh, so I'm collecting them, writing them. Uh, I need a few more. And then there is another Greek American that... Uh he made a collection of short stories and he became very popular. Uh, he described uh, his uh, living with his Greek family. I don't oh, remember. Oh, yes. What, what, David Sparris. Yes, there is. Exactly. Do, have yeah. you, do you like him? I, I love his writing. I've never met him in person, but I think he's very funny. I think so, too. I think so, too. So are you planning to, to do it in the same way as him, a collection of short stories? and? Yes, exactly. I think he writes um, nonfiction. I write both fiction and nonfiction um, and a little more fiction than nonfiction. So I think I, I'm going to go more in the fiction route. In the, in the fiction route. Okay. Yeah. And uh, can you talk a little bit more about your uh, your writings? I mean... I had uh, the opportunity to read few of them. I haven't read them all, mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm, uh, I'm a bookworm and I'm reading quite a bit. I didn't mm -hmm. have all the time now to read everything of yours. So can you tell us a little bit about your stories? I mean, you're probably a natural storyteller. Uh, that is an element of creativity. So can you tell us a little bit more about the, the fiction sure. that you're writing? Yeah, so I love writing. Um, it's a great creative outlet for me. And um, a lot of times I'm thinking about something, struggling with like an idea, a concept. Like one of them was about rejection. Um, and, you know, you think about how pervasive rejection is in our lives, you know, from when you're a child, whether you're rejected off the team or you're rejected from college or you're rejected by your lover or, you know, all the different ways that we get rejected. And so I'll get an idea like that sort of stuck in my head and then I'll start thinking about it and um, try to create a story around that theme. So that's generally how I work. And uh, it, it, do I guess right is the restrict, uh, restrictive and uprising? Restive yeah. And, yeah. Is that yes. correct? Is that the... That is the one about rejection, exactly. Yeah. All right. I, I will have to read this one. It's very interesting. <laughs> But is it so that, uh, did I read correctly that uh, in The Perfect Husband, you're trying to describe uh, the, the, the perfect husband? Is that correct? Are you married, Miss Dear Marina? Yes, I am married and uh, happily married and uh, for 25 years, actually 26 years. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, oh no, sorry. 25 years. I got the number wrong. 25 years. Um, and, uh, I hope the husband is not listening. <laughs> we always forget our anniversary, both of us. It's right around my birthday. So 
uh, somehow we remember my birthday, but we forget our anniversary. And, and then your birthday is what month? Uh, August or uh, December? It, it, it's in August. All right. August. I, 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 I guess I guessed right. <laughs> so, um, it was actually this month. It was this month. Yes. Um, happy birthday. Thank you so much. So please go so, ahead about the perfect husband. So what is that? Yes. Uh, is yes. that a dream scenario? Is that a fiction uh, again? No, that was nonfiction. Um, I was frustrated with my husband who did not want to come to Morocco with me for a friend's birthday party. And I started imagining, you know, boy, you know, if I had the perfect husband, what would he be like? And so I drew up these different scenarios <coughs> and, um, what, and then I sort of took them to each to their logical extreme and, um, recognized that. And I think this is very common with our partner. Um, it's that the very thing that most attracts me to him and draws me to him is often the thing that because it's so glaring is often the thing that also annoys me about him. So in this case, it's about his independence of mind. Um, he's a very independent thinker, likes to do his own thing. Um, and so he doesn't want to just like, he, he has his own interests and his own passions um, and so that's why he doesn't want to go, didn't want to go to Morocco with me. Um, and so that's sort of, I was trying to get at a bigger concept, which is how often what we're most attracted to um, in another person is also, um, may, I don't know if I would say their fatal flaw, but what, uh, you know, is most annoying about them as well. Yeah, <clears throat> I wonder if one day we will just simplify the the love uh, relationship uh, as a uh, by using the metaphor of a battery. You know that the opposite attract each other. Right. <laughs> so, um, so what can you tell me about your future plan? I mean, you, 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 you are an investor now in multiple companies and you're advising boards. I mean, are you an active board member of, uh, of, uh, I chair a board, um, Levitronics technologies, um, based in Zurich. Um, but I have actually, um, and that's again about Star Trek stuff. We're talking about, uh, levi magnetic leviating machines and so and so, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and there. Congratulations, dear Marina. I mean, uh, you prove that the uh, woman in tech can do a lot of things. Well, I I deserve no credit whatsoever. They are an amazing team, and um, I'm I'm really honored to be part of it because um, they are just an extraordinary group of people um, that are doing amazing things. Um, so. Uh, I've, uh, my other boards, we sold, um, Sign Ashore, which was a public company, um, about a year ago or so, maybe a little longer. Um, and, uh, the other boards, um, I've, I've gotten off of. So, uh, I wanted to focus a little bit more on my writing. Um, and, uh, the board work takes quite a bit of time. So, uh, I am active on the Levitronics board, I chair that board. And then um, I advise another company called Inkbit out of MIT. Mm -hmm. um, I can see the website of the, I can see the website of uh, Levitronics. Um, they have also um, nanotechnology and uh, water purification devices. Mm -hmm. uh, in Cyprus, we do have a problem with the, the water, uh, and such a technology would have been fantastic. I mean, both technologies, the 3D printing and the water purification, I think that they are important technologies for the future of the Cypriotic economy. What, what's, your, mm -hmm. what's your view on the subject? Um, well, the markets that Levitronics is in today, it's predominantly the semiconductor market, which I don't think would be particularly relevant. Um, but it's moving increasingly into life science. But again, I'm not sure 
if that would be hugely relevant um, to Cyprus. Um, so I, I'd have to learn a little bit more about it. Okay. I kind of like a, I made the comment based on the first glance that uh, because two years ago I visited Cyprus uh, as part of the economic diplomacy, um, some invitation from the economic diplomacy department of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they asked my opinion about uh, the future of the technology and the economy. And I said that, of course, the independence in water, I mean, all the reports that we are reading is that the future wars will uh, be about water and the water supply. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And so that means that basically having a country that, uh, like Israel is doing, they, they do have a lot of water purification plants, desaltation plants, so they are quite independent from the water supply. And I think that Cyprus needs to do the same thing. Yes, I agree. And then the second thing was that basically I asked them back then, I remember very well, if they have a list of all the imported raw materials and they asked me why. And I said that, um, you know, in 10 years time with 3D printing, the only thing that you need is the raw materials and then you can print everything locally. Well, yeah, it's um, the issue with 3D printing is the economics. Um, and so when you're talking about a custom product, 3D printing makes a lot of sense or very low volume, meaning like a handful. Um, but when you're talking high volume, the economics make it very difficult to compete with existing manufacturing technologies. Yeah, but isn't it so that uh, it will follow the classic consumer price reduction model where, you know, as the time goes, the operating costs, they will be reduced and therefore you know, it will lead into a situation that it will be economically viable to 3D print everything. Um, no, I not everything. Um, they're just the exist. Some of the existing uh, manufacturing methods for creating um, things in high volume are so so inexpensive that. Um, 3D printing will just never, there's no way it will ever compete. But I do agree with you that over time, the markets that it can compete will definitely grow. Yeah, if, if, we, if we see it from the circular economy point of view, that the total energy cost for manufacturing something, transporting that and consuming it, definitely will be much more higher than producing it locally, even mm -hmm. with a little bit less uh, quality. Mm -hmm. Th that's my opinion for the, for the long term. I mean, there is no point of uh, manufacturing something in China and shipping it with containers to Cyprus when we can have a library of, uh, of those 3D models and actually produce them locally. Yeah, well, and actually that's how all the research came about at MIT. The goal of the professor at MIT was uh, to use this in outer space. So when NASA launched rockets um, to the moon, it could take with it, instead of a lot of spare parts, it could take a bag of powder and a 3D printer, and then all the CAD files required to 3D print whatever spare part they needed. I am, I kind of like, I totally agree with the professor, even though I'm a high school dropout. <laughs> 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 All right. So, so tell me more about the, the future plans of yours, uh, dear Marina. I mean, what the future beyond the, the riding and what, what do you want to see? I mean, do you want to create some um, unicorn or do you want to write the perfect fiction book? What, what, what's your personal objective? Uh, my personal objective is to improve my writing and um, uh, really work on that. Uh, the other 
Uh, things that I do are really interesting and they're really fun. I love working with the Greek ecosystem. I'm actually going on a trip to Japan in two weeks um, to talk about entrepreneurship there. Um, and I love doing that. I think it's really fun to see where entrepreneurship is around the world. Um, and so I really like that balance of the very introverted writing along with the extroverted um, activities associated with whether it's angel investing or speaking. I, you know, I'm a part-time couch philosopher and uh, some nights uh -huh. I'm kind of like a stay awake and start thinking like, uh, because I want, I'm one of those guys that I want to ch bring a positive change to the world. Uh, so, and I'm thinking like, uh, how can I do it? Like, can I create the super kind of like a duper startup? Like the one that I have now has a mission statement of democratizing education with technology, uh, or uh -huh. shall I write a book? And then uh, my conclusion always has been the following that one book, one single book has changed the lives of billions of people. Just like that, sure. where yeah. a startup uh, or a company in general, uh, you know, we don't have an example that basically has changing, changed positively the, the life of billions. We, we, we do have uh, examples of uh, corporations that they have actually doing uh, rather negative uh, things into the society, rather positive ones. But a book, especially fiction books, are the ones mm -hmm. that basically they take us to the moon. Mm -hmm. So I will say so that uh, you have to write the best fiction book about the next generations. That's well, my I'm, personal I'm, opinion. I'm glad you agree with me that that's the most important thing I can do. I'm, I'm glad we agree. Can you have Greek superheroes inside? Absolutely. I always have Greek superheroes. All Absolutely. Right. If you can use my archetype, please use it freely. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dear Marina. Do you have uh, kids? I forgot to ask. Um, sorry, there's a plane flying. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I was saying that you're happily married for 25 years and uh, yeah. uh, most probably you have a large family in, down in Greece. Well, uh, yes. Uh, well, which location from Greece you are? Um, both my parents grew up in Athens. Uh huh. But originally, my mother's family is from Asia Minor, from Constantinople and Smyrna. Wow. And and my father's family is from Karpenisi. Okay, that's very nice. And we uh, we used to go to Karpenisi when I was very little, and my understanding is that it's changed very dramatically since those days. So I I want to go back. Oh, so you. You are not living in Greece. You are living in the, in the States. Yes, I live in Boston. Oh, you live in Boston. There's a huge community of uh, Greeks in Boston. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think that uh, how, how many thousands you are, like a hundred thousand or? It's a big number. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We used to have, uh, we used to have, we used to have an office uh, from Nokia during my Nokia times. We had an office in uh, Boston. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and uh, one day I visited the, the office and uh, I was expecting to see Americans, but then I found Greeks with the big moustaches. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. So did you have your vacations uh, yet? or? Yes, just finishing it up. Ah, what about... Um, just all over. Lo I love Greece so much. Um, it's... I love Athens. I love the islands. I, my daughter actually has fallen in love with Greece and um, has spent a semester in Athens. And she's gotten to know certain areas uh, better than I have. And so she's trying to get me to explore more of Greece as well. Well, I give you a tip. Uh, you know that basically we had uh, or we still have the the Hollywood Boulevard, you know, in Los Angeles, you have the Hollywood Boulevard, but we Greeks had it uh, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh-huh. 
It's called uh, tripod, like triple dash. Yeah. It's the it's the street of Europe that hasn't changed the name for two and a half thousand years. Oh wow! And is uh, on I, I, if you walk clockwise from uh, Anafiotica in uh, Athens to, around Acropolis towards the Irodio of Atticu, the new uh, museum of Acropolis, that street behind the the, the Holy Rock. It's called Tripod, and he had the the engravings of uh, you know the best actors and the best movies, exactly like in Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, you're kidding! No, I'm not kidding. That's uh, actually a, a historical fact, and you can walk it, and you can see it, and you can see the inscriptions on the walls. Oh, that's really neat. <laughs> yeah, Tripod. Okay, that's great to know. Dear Marina, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much for uh, participating on the the Marshall podcast. Uh, Great chatting with you. I really enjoyed it myself. Okay, that's great to hear. And I hope one day we meet uh, face to face. I hope so. That would be wonderful. Exactly. Thank you very much, dear Marina. Have a great day and enjoy your vacations. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.